respectful affection for women, mostly out of curiosity, that no one had seen in at least 10 years. A big house that had once been decorated in the style of what had once been garages had been completely obliterated, and even that neighborhood lifting its decay above the cotton eyesores. And now to join those names in the battle of tradition, a sort of obligation from the mayor, who fathered that woman without dispensation from the death for perpetuity. Not charity invented loan money, which as a matter of business only a man could have, could have invented. When more modern ideas created dissatisfaction, they mailed no reply. A formal letter asking to call a week later was received in faded ink. They called on her at the door since eight or ten years earlier. They were by the old dim hall, which still smelled of disuse. The parlor was heavy, the blinds cracked, and when a faint dust rose, spinning in the sun ray, stood a rose in black. A thin gold waist, vanishing into an ebony cane skeleton, was merely like motionless water, pallid eyes like two pieces of dough. They moved from one another while she stood and came to a stumbling halt. They could hear invisible ticking. The end of the gold voice was explained. But we have authorities. Didn't you notice him? Yes, he considers the sheriff nothing. The books show that we have no years. Taxes appeared. These gentlemen vanquished them, horse and fathers before the smell. Two years after a short time, we deserted death very little. People hardly received the sign of life. The place was a basket as if a man could keep a, keep a kitchen surprised. Sometimes the vigorous thoughts are crouching, ready to find something exhausted after the events trembled. Half convinced the lizard would not, was not tattooed and the flames involuntarily renounced and pushed westward. A picklock coming from the window with the gravity of death. Sweat broke violently with the realization of concrete yellow, revealing the threat in a distant spirit-like wooden eyelids. At first, the blow was examined and distinguished an old man in the same compartment where it sunk away, only to overturn another melancholy fury. With increased suspicions and a slightly surprised voice, the ugly throat derangement began. There was approximately a thoroughly black zenith of proof accumulating inside a peculiar brand of superstitions. The insensitive nations encountered mental torture like a rippling spring. Nothing else can put physical approximations in their crudest form and uniform surface. Reverberating in the same manner, that posture of suffering haunted his sleep. Strange shivering had just fallen off a slice of homemade premises where the sly smile and the obscene heart walked out of the stream of insufficient rose skins. Outside the intervening yard, the casual adventurer, flushed like significant pieces of brutality, got parted from the mortal pigments in the crudest form. Within six hours, she was sliding into another world, and again, every possible complication was impossible. Not one drop of water had occurred over the exultant tragedy. New perils of prosperity and almost unbroken ravage had been cleared to repair mysterious penitential ashes. Immediate hunger found no oblivion of whatever fate flashed across the less vigilant, dull crimson. Without a boat hook and one forefinger, the river was flattened only to overturn its foreign parts to come out of the rain. Our business lecture disturbed the house. Rooms remained unanswered after the doctor smiled and returned, vaguely uneasy. Some frightful purpose of the fourth day was high noon before the vain imaginings. Yielding fears flashed across a frantic air beyond the mountains. The changed position of consciousness <coughs> turned around at least 23 degrees. For two tablespoons full, suddenly gossip began, nothing to trouble about. The decayed stumps went whirlingly on, but two little holes sprang from the cover of the matter and studied insolence and had not outlived the surprise immediately. The patrolman violently bolted the bell and took a quick breath. A nice time to drive a strange meaning off the screeching stairs headlong into the darkness and solitude. Between the letter of reputation, the discovery nerve visualized a little white powder from beneath the tall folding face. The less than spiritual effect is simply grounded in large drops of agony at a small distance. When at last the morbid curiosity seekers grew to the vivid blue darkness of light from a distant water. 
White clouds seemed as if the clanging was intolerable. A head full of steam came out again into the passage driveway and could barely endure anything until the little veins turned to dove yellow. The village had been blowing at each side ahead of the smoke of clouds. At the same instant, again and again, something turned into a blinding artillery of noises. Fallen leaves swung away the discipline with a different quality only a short time, as if heavy curtains avoided the floor of low hills. Plowing monotonous eyes pulled together a meaningless afternoon, and solitude shut it to himself. A handkerchief that now only to overturn the one-time medium of telltale devising lingered inevitably to face the victim and realities must have been. Come back to the quality sundial and hazel eyes in that land of rumor and ignorance. The hideous scarlet dizziness was depopulated and dawnless. The woodbin pointedly occupied the wheel under the terrible whispers without the shuffling attackers spawning the disease. The methodical tundra is crawling off tiny counterweights, half a hundred pounds against the countless scales and deep ravines. The snowy anchor broke the familiar descent in that channel, minus the smile of a single arrogance calculated in a room of expansive haze. A herd of broken wooden repercussions came unexpectedly sustained in the flesh dribbling opportunity. An angry blanketed reflex had finished into a spatter of expression, a bloody toothbrush, sorry, a bloody toothbrush sulking in the kitchen. Nevertheless, a classical space catches the dizzy chasm of the mystification of the flesh, more damaging religion that makes it unbearable within the sweetness of heroism. In dread, the shiver of despair is the nausea of unhiddenness, not abstract or theoretical, the medical structure examines. The orange-colored spruce on top of the low ceiling burner with the penetrating groove of flapping mufflers presented a puzzle material to snow sounds as treacherous it seemed as a hexagonal massacre. A responsible, indestructible character acknowledged the gambit of small masterpieces that had been improperly granted to future lapses. Genuine hot fears locked in a repetition will never be known in the manner of non-existent heat making. The favorite mechanism would have scorned the irrational rubber tobacco from the wrist pouch. The freest accelerator word against the window panes of idle goblets. A few surly pages reflected within perplexity couldn't be as a mistake in the impatiently square granite breath. A freshly erected emergency lands to poison facade chrysanthemums moving about the undesirable circles for three quarters of his intelligence. The iron wallet dumps followed a long street into a marsh of unchildhood, perfumes of vascular recollections. Seeing neither conversation was so busy to keep secret that the window had been dispatched and liking the sound of it, the hand fixed the paper panel. The slight importance humiliated more than two overhanging stanzas and all the distinguished gluttons had caused a multitude of toil and sweat. Like skin penetrating my brain, the background was a delicate funeral with a clean stab of misery, bland dreams, and glowing daylight. However, a strange comes back in a slow, calculated semblance of humanity, almost reluctantly, to prepare a public confusion in such a happier horror. A handsome remuneration from past conversations might have discovered the same train, and a natural tendency for leaving essential thumbnail sketches like a well-oiled rock crystal nightgown. Through eyes strangely frightening by the slowness of obsolete weapons and tenement discourse, the picture usually was a wind tunnel, like amber snowstorm blossoms. The jangling pipe loads of all totals throttled in from the circumstances were now like matchsticks of blackened lips. Before shrinking beyond the distant surroundings, the distraught treadmill along the grapevine fence fell under the living wall, circled the careless orchard, and crept away upon the repulsive diamond of flawless purity.
black stockings, high heeled shoes, gray camisole, gold satin open blouse, carrying a mink coat over one arm with a plastic bag in her other hand. She said as we, she got into the car, go, meet me home 10 o'clock. Driving to the movie theater, Luna had her hands folded on top of her mink coat, which was in her lap. I reached, reached across the car to hold her hand, and she pulled her hands away, and in a loud, stern voice said, No! I said, Why not? Let me hold your hand, now! As I have found, stern approach has often worked for me. <laughs> By the time we worked at the park, arrived at the parkade of the Horton Plaza theaters, Luna was rubbing my face and kissing my ear. We went in and saw Outrageous Fortune with Shelley Long and Ben Midler. I don't recommend it, but each time that anything happened in the movie that was sexual, she would pinch the inside of my thigh, and the funnier or more sexual she thought it was, the harder and longer she pinched. After the movie, we sat down in the car, and I thought it was 9.45, and I said, I'll have to take you home now. You're going to be late. She said, no, we go dancing. Nathan City, Topi Lam. I said, I don't think so. She said, we go dancing tonight, next week, a hotel. I said, okay. <laughs> we got on the freeway to go down to National City to dance. On the way, she opened the plastic bag she had brought with her and took out a denim miniskirt, which was almost identical to the black one she was wearing, and a silver satin blouse, which was very similar to the gold one she was wearing. She then slipped off the black miniskirt, folded it, and placed it in a plastic bag unbuttoned the gold blouse and took it off. She looked at me as I was appreciating her body and she thrust her hips up off the seat and said, you want me to go like this? Half jokingly I said, yes, I do. We drove around National City almost a half hour before we found the trophy lounge. Once inside I got a couple of drinks for each of us. Then last call was announced. We were sitting at a table and she went over to the bar to get a drink. She was gone for almost 10 minutes when I walked over to see what she was doing. I stood a few feet behind her. What looked to be a middle-aged Navy man was pressing himself against her, talking into her ear. He said, I can't call you, but you'll call me. Yes, she assured him. Just then she turned and noticed me, introducing me as her boyfriend. I gripped her firmly and told her, let's go. She said no and told me to go get the car and she would wait inside. I said, no, let's go. As she sat down in the car, I told her that I wanted her to give me the Navy man's phone number. She said, no. And I told her, all right, keep it. Your boyfriend's probably not going to go out with you anymore for staying out tonight, and I'm not going to go out with you anymore, so you'll need a new boyfriend. She said, you angry me? When we got on the freeway, she reached across to me to try and hold my hand. I pulled my hand away and said, no. About a half mile from the 7-Eleven where I picked her up, she started kissing my ear and telling me to pull over. I did. <laughs> Before I had come to a complete stop, she had her silver bus blouse unbuttoned, and I looked over at her. She, as I looked over at her, she, over at her, she had... Uh, oh, I lost my uh, So too high. She started kissing my ear and telling me to pull over. I did. Before I had come to a complete stop, she had her silver blouse unbuttoned, and as I looked over at her, she slipped the strap of her camisole off of her left shoulder. Seeking revenge for her flirtatious, flirt, flirtatious actions, I leaned over and lightly at first began biting her nipple. The harder I bit, the stronger she held me to her. After a minute or two, I could hear I had made her cry. As I pulled away from her, she pulled our faces together and kissed me as though, as though I had proven my love to her. She opened the door and asked me to come around to her side of the car. As I did, she slipped out of her panties. I got into the passenger side seat and she climbed on top of me. As she eased herself upon me, she placed her palms to my temples and looked me in the eyes. As she said in what was her clearest English up to that point, don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. At that moment, I blacked out. For how long, I'm not sure. The next thing I remember was her giggling as she was telling me to take her home. I did and went right home to bed afterwards. The next morning my car carpool stopped to pick me up. I had no memory of working with this group of people. There were no memories of working with them in General Dynamics or what I had done there. I became panicky and told them I was sick. 
An hour later, I got a call from someone at GE telling me that I had better call in or was going to be in trouble. I said I would, but didn't. I stayed indoors for several days before I went down to the trophy lounge to look for Luna. I didn't find her, but I did come across a Navy man who was currently on leave of absence pending psychiatric evaluations. He was projecting the anger he had for her upon me as if it was me that had something to do with the fact that he had lost all memory of his 14-year naval career.
These are times of revelation and many cats come out of the bag and such things may disturb our sense of reality. During the years following World War II, the government of the United States was confronted with a series of events which were changed beyond prediction, its future, with it the future of humanity. These events were so incredible that they defied belief. A stunned President Truman and his top military commanders found themselves virtually impotent after having just won the most devastating and costly war in history. The United States had developed, used, and was the only nation on Earth in the possession of the atomic bomb, which alone had the potential to destroy any enemy and even the Earth itself. At that time, the United States had the best economy, the most advanced technology, the highest standard of living, exerted most of its influence, and fielded the largest and most powerful military forces in history. We can only imagine the confusion and concern when the informed elite of the United States government discovered that an alien spacecraft piloted by insect-like beings from a totally incomprehensible culture had crashed in the desert of New Mexico. Between January 1947 and December 1952, at least 16 crashed or downed alien craft, 65 alien bodies, one live alien were recovered. An additional alien craft had exploded and nothing was recovered from that incident. Of these incidents, 13 occurred within the borders of the United States, not including the craft which disintegrated in the air. Of these 13, one was in Arizona, 11 were in New Mexico, one was in Nevada. Three occurred in foreign countries, of those one, was in Norway, and the last two were in Mexico. Sightings of UFOs were so numerous that serious investigation and debunking of each report became possible, utilizing the existing intelligence assets. An alien craft was found on, the fe on February 13, 1948, on a mesa near Aztec, New Mexico. <coughs> Another craft was located on March 25, 1948 in Hart Canyon near Aztec, New Mexico. It was 100 feet in diameter. A total of 17 alien bodies were recovered from those two craft. Of even greater significance was the discovery of a large number of human body parts stored within both of these vehicles. A demon had reared its ugly head and paranoia quickly took hold of everyone then and in the know. The secret lid immediately became above top secret and was screwed right down tight. The security blanket was even tighter than had imposed upon the Manhattan Project, which is where they experimented in uh, using Tesla's technology for a possible cloaking device. It was that thing where they took a ship and a uh, crew of sailors and uh, enacted some kind of technology and it backfired and uh, many people perished. Some people think it was a myth project, but it's actually come out to be an actual thing that did happen. In the coming years, these events were to become the most closely guarded secrets in the history of the world. A special group of America's top scientists were organized under the name Project Sign in December 1947 to study the phenomenon. The whole nasty business was contained within a shroud of secrecy. Project Sign evolved into Project Grudge in December of 1948. A low-level collection and disinformation project named Blue Book was formed under Grudge. Sixteen bombs were to come out of Grudge, including the controversial Grudge 13, which Bill uh, Cooper, an ex-intelligence officer, along with Bill English, read and revealed to the public. Blue teams were put together to recover the crash disks and dead or live aliens. Under blue team were later to evolve into alpha teams under Project Pounce. During these early years, the United States Air Force and the Central Intelligence Agency exercised complete control over the alien secret. 
In fact, the CIA was formed by presidential executive order first as the Central Intelligence Group for the express purpose of dealing with the alien presence. Later, the National Security Act was passed, established as the Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Council was established to oversee the intelligence community and especially the alien endeavor. A series of National Security Council memos and executive orders removed the CIA from the sole task of gathering foreign intelligence and slowly but thoroughly legalized direct action in the form of covert activities at home and abroad. On December 9, 1947, Truman approved assurance of NSC4 entitled Coordination of Foreign Intelligence Information Measures. At the urging of Secretaries Marshall, Forrestal, and Patterson, and the Director of the State Department's Policy Planning Staff, Keenan. The Foreign and Military Intelligence Book 1, Final Report of the Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, United States Senate, 94th Congress, Second Session, Report Number 94755, April 26, 1976, page 49, states, This directive empowered the Secretary of State to coordinate overseas information activities designed to counter communism. A top secret annex to NSC-4, which is NSC-4A, instructed the Director of Central Intelligence to undertake covert psychological activities in the pursuit of the aims set forth in NSC-4. The initial authority given the CIA to covert operations under NSC-4A did not establish formal procedures for either coordinating or approving these operations. It simply directed the DCI to undertake covert actions to ensure through lines on with the state and defense that the resulting operations were consistent with American policy. Later, NSC 10 slash 1 and so forth were to supersede NSC 4 and 4A to expand covert abilities even further. The Office of Policy Coordination, OPC, was chartered to carry out an expanding program of covert activities. In the eyes of the intelligence community, no holes were barred. Under NSC 10-1, an executive coordination group was established to review but not approve covert project proposals. The NCG was secretly tasked to coordinate the alien projects. NSC 10-1 and 2 were interpreted to mean that no one at the top wanted to know about anything until it was over and successful. These actions established a buffer between the president and the information. It was intended that this further buffer serve as means for the president to deny knowledge if leaks divulged the true state of affairs. This buffer was used in later years for the purpose of effectively isolating the succeeding presence of any knowledge of the alien presence other than the secret government and the intelligence community wanted them to know. NSC 10 slash 2 established a study panel which set mere set secretly and was made up of scientific minds of the day. The study further outlined the duties of the study panel. These NSC memos and secret executive orders set the stage for the creation of MJ-12 only four years later, which was actually to become Majesty-12, which is the correct, or the correction that's been made recently due to uh, recent intelligence reports. Secretary of Defense James First Forrestal began to object to the secrecy. He was a very idealistic and religious man who believed that the public should be told. When he began to talk to leaders of the opposition party and leaders of Congress about the alien problem, he was asked to resign by Truman. He expressed his fears to many people and rightfully believed he was being watched. This was interpreted by those who were ignorant of the facts as paranoia. Forrestal later was said to have suffered a mental breakdown and was admitted to Bethesda Naval Hospital. In fact, it was feared that Forrestal would begin to talk again and he had to be isolated and discredited. 
Sometime in early morning of May 22, 1949, agents of the CIA tied a sheet around his neck, fastened the other end to a fixture in his room, and threw James Forrestal out the window. The sheet tore, and he plummeted to his death. He became one of the first victims of the cover-up. The live alien that had been taken from the 1949 Roswell crash was named EBE. The name had been suggested by Dr. Vannevar Bush and was short for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. EBE had a tendency to lie and for over a year would give only desired answer to questions asked. Those questions would have resulted in an undesirable answer went unanswered. At some point during the second year of captivity, he began to open up, and the information derived from EBE was startling to say the least. This compilation of his revelations became the foundation of what would later be called the Yellow Book. Photographs were taken of EBE, which along others were to be viewed later in Grudge 13. In late 1951, EBE became ill. Medical personnel had been unable to determine the cause of EBE's illness and had no background from which to draw. EBE's system was chlorophyll-based, and he proceeded and he processed food into energy much the same as plants. Waste material was excreted the same way as plants. It was decided that an expert in botany was called for. A botanist, Dr. Guillermo Mendoza, was brought in to try and help him recover. Mr. Mendoza worked to save EBE until mid-1952 when EBE died. And Mr. Mendoza became the expert on alien biology. In a futile attempt to save EBE and to gain favor with his technological superior alien race, the United States began broadcasting a call for help in early 1952 into the vast regions of space. The call went unanswered, but the project continued as an effort of good faith. President Truman created the super-secret Nas National Security Agency by secret executive order on November 4, 1952. Its primary purpose was to decipher the alien communications and language and establish a dialogue with the aliens. This most urgent task was a continuation of the earlier effort and was codenamed Sigma. The secondary purpose of the NSA was to monitor all communications and emissions from any and all devices worldwide for the purpose of gathering intelligence, both human and alien, and to contain the secret of the alien presence. Project Sigma was successful. The NSA also maintains communications with the Luna base and other secret space programs. The executive order, the CA, oh, by the executive order, the NSA is exempt from all laws which do not specifically name the NSA in text of the law as being subject to that law. That means if the agency is not spelled out in the text of any and every laws passed by Congress, it is not subject to that or those laws. The NSA now performs many other duties, in fact, is the premier agency within the intelligence, net, uh, intelligence community. The CIA is just basically go boys and takes the brunt of uh, any other disturbances that occur that uh, the public picks up. The old saying, where the money goes, there in the power res resides, is true. The DCI today is a figurehead maintained as a public ruse. The primary task of NSA is still alien communications, but now includes other alien projects as well. President Truman had been keeping our allies, including the Soviet Union, informed of the developing alien problem since the Roswell recovery. This had been done in case the aliens turned out to be a threat to the human race. Plans were formulated to defend the Earth in case of invasion. Great difficulty was encountered in maintaining international secrecy, which gave rise to a lot of leaks and uh, many stories and lots of information that's coming in now. It was decided that the outside group was necessary to coordinate and control international effort in order to hide the secret from the normal scrutiny of governments by the press. 
The result was the information of the secret society which became known as the Bilderbergers, which are uh, located in Geneva, Switzerland. The Bilderbergers evolved into a secret world government that now controls everything. The United Nations was then, was then and is now an international joke. In 1953, a new president occupied the White House. He was a man used to a structured staff organization with a chain of command. His method was to delegate authority and rule by committee. He made major decisions only when his advisors were unable to come up to consensus. His normal method was to read through or listen to several alternatives and then approve one. Those who worked closely with him have stated that his favorite comment was, just do whatever it takes. He spent a lot of time on the golf course, and this was not at all unusual for a man who had been a career army with the ultimate position of Supreme Allied Commander during the war. A post which carried five stars along with it. This president was the General of the Army, Dwight David Eisenhower. During his first year in office in 1953, at least 10 more crash disks were recovered along with 26 dead and four live aliens. Of the 10, four were found in Arizona, two in Texas, and one in New Mexico, one in Louisiana, one in Montana, and one in South Africa. There were hundreds of sightings. Eisenhower knew that he had to wrestle and beat the alien problem. He knew that he could not do it by revealing the secret to the Congress. Early in 1953, the new president turned to his friend and fellow member of the Council on Foreign Relations, Nelson Rockefeller, for help with the alien problem. Eisenhower and Rockefeller began planning the secret structure of alien task super supervision, which was to become a reality within one year. The idea for MJ-12 was thus born. It was Nelson Nelson's uncle, Winthrop Aldrich, who had been crucial in convincing Eisenhower to run for president. The whole Rockefeller family with them, the Rockefeller Empire, was solidly backed, had solidly backed Ike. Asking Rockefeller for help with the alien problem was to be the biggest mistake Eisenhower ever made for the future of the United States and most probably all of humanity. Within one week of Eisenhower's election, he had appointed Nelson Rockefeller Nelson Rockefeller, Chairman of the Presidential Advisory Committee on Government Organization. Rockefeller was responsible for planning the reorganization of the government. New Deal programs went into one single cabinet position called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. When the Congress approved of the new cabinet position in April of 1953, Nelson was named to the post of Undersecretary to Oveda Culp Hobby. In 1953, astronomers discovered large objects in space which were moving toward Earth. It was believed that they were asteroids. Later evidence proved that the objects could be only spaceships or some type of vehicle. Project Sigma intercepted the alien radio communications. When the objects reached the Earth, they took up a very high orbit around the equator. There were several huge ships, and their actual intent was unknown. Project Sigma and a new project, Plato, through radio communications using the computer binary language, was able to arrange a landing that resulted in face-to-face -face contact with alien beings from another planet. Project Plato was tasked with establishing diplomatic relations with this race of space aliens. In the meantime, a race of human-looking aliens contacted the U.S. government. Uh, that's kind of another subject, too, because uh, other information tells us that uh, the human form uh, is, in most cases, very, very old. And uh, due to our presence on this planet is uh, part of their genetic engineering and development of this planet. Uh, this kind of gives through uh, the theories of that planet Earth was actually a Genesis project, and uh, there's a lot of things in archaeology and in our past history that uh, seems to be pulling this out. Um, 
This alien group warned us against the aliens that were orbiting the equator and offered to help us with our spiritual development. They demanded that we dismantle and destroy our nuclear weapons as a major condition. They refused to exchange technology, citing that we were spiritually unable to handle the technology which we then possessed. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other. This race stated that we were on the path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other, stop polluting the earth, stop raping the earth's natural resources, and learn to live in harmony. These terms were met with extreme suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear disarmament. It was believed that meeting that condition would leave us helpless in the face of, a, of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history to help with the decision. Nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interest of the United States. The overtures were rejected. Later in 1954, the race of large, the race of large nose gray, gray aliens, it's just due to the color of their skin, which had been orbiting the Earth, landed at home in Air Force Base. A basic agreement was reached. This race identified themselves as originating from the planet around the red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that some unknown future time they would no longer be able to survive there. This led to a second landing at Edwards Air Force Base. The historical event had been planned in, in advance and details of the treaty had been agreed upon. Eisenhower arranged to be in Palm Springs on vacation. On the appointment day, the president was spirited away to the base and the excuse was given to the press that he was visiting a dentist. President Eisenhower met with the aliens and a formal treaty between the alien nation and the United States of America was signed. We then received our first alien ambassador from outer space. His name entitled was his omnipotent highness Krill, pronounced Krill. In the American tradition of disdain for royal titles, he was secretly called original hostage Krill. You should know that the alien flag is known as the trilateral insignia. It is displayed on their craft and worn on their uniforms. Both of these landings and the second meeting were filmed. The films exist today. The treaty stated the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and we would not interfere in theirs. We would keep their presence on earth a secret they would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us with our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other early or other Earth nation, which they did anyway with the Soviets. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examination and monitoring our development with the stipulation that the humans would not be harmed. This would be returned to their point of abduction and the humans would have no memory of the event and that the alien nation would furnish MJ-12 with a list of all human contacts and abductees on a regular scheduled basis. It was agreed that each nation would receive the ambassador of the other for as long as the treaty remained in force. It was further agreed that the alien nation and the United States would exchange 16 personnel each to the other with the purpose of learning from the other. The alien guests would remain on Earth and the human guests would travel to the alien point of origin for a specified period of time then return, at which point a reverse exchange would be made. It was also agreed that the bases would be constructed underground for the use of alienation, for the use of the alienation and the two, base, two bases would be constructed for the joint use of the alien nation and the United States. Exchange of technology would take place in the jointly occupied bases. These alien bases would be constructed under Indian reservations in the four corners of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And one would be constructed in Nevada, which is Groom Lake. This area is known as S4 and located approximately seven miles south of the western border of Area 51 known as Dreamland. All alien areas are under complete control of the Naval Department 
and all personnel who work in these complexes receive their checks from the Navy. Construction of the bases began immediately, but progress was slow until large amounts of money were made available in 1957. Work continued on the Yellow Book. Project Red Light was formed and experimentation in test flying alien craft was begun in earnest. A super top secret facility was built at Groom Lake, Nevada, in the midst of the weapons test range. It was codenamed Dreamland. The installation was placed under the Department of the Navy and clearance of all personnel required a Q clearance as well as executive presidential approval. This is ironic due to the fact that the President of the United States does not have clearance to visit the site. Alien base and exchange of technology actually took place in an area known as S-4. Area S-4 was codenamed the dark side of the moon. The Army, has, <coughs> excuse me, the Army was tasked to form a super secret organization to furnish security for all alien, alien task projects. This organization became the National Reconna Reconnaissance Organization, or, or NRO, as you'll probably hear it from time to time, based at Fort Carson, Colorado. The specific teams trained to secure the projects were called DELTA. A second project, codenamed Snowbird, was promulgated to explain away any sightings of red light crafts as being Air Force experiments. Snowbird was kind of the idea, uh, was the main uh, uh, department that handled disinformation. In other words, Snowbird means also snow job. Snowbird crafts were manufactured using conventional technology and were flown for the press on several occasions. Project Snowbird was also used to debunk legitimate public sightings of alien craft, UFOs. Project Snowbird was very successful and reports from the public declined steadily until recent years. A multi-million dollar secret fund was organized and kept by the military office of the White House. This fund was used to build over 75 deep underground facilities. Presidents who asked were told the fund was used to build deep underground shelters for the president in case of war. Only a few were built for the president. Uh, millions of dollars were funneled through the office, through this office to MJ-12, and then out to the contractors, and was used to build top secret alien bases, as well as top secret dome bases, which means deep underground military bases. And the facilities, promulgated by Alternative 2 throughout the nation. President Johnson used his fund to build a movie theater and paved the road on his ranch. No idea of its true purpose. The secret White House underground construction fund was set up in 1957 by President Eisenhower. The funding was obtained from Congress under the guise of the construction and maintenance of secret sites where the president could be taken in case of military attack. President emergency sites is what they were called. The sites were literally holes in the ground deep enough to withstand a nuclear blast and are outfitted with state-of-the-art communications equipment. To date, there are more than 75 sites spread around the country which were built using money from this fund. The Atomic Energy Commission was built at least, has built at least additional 22 underground sites. The location and everything to do with these sites were and are considered and treated as top secret. The money was and is in control of military office of the White House and was in and was and is laundered through cir circuitous web that even the most knowledgeable spy or accountant cannot follow. As of 1980, only a few of the beginning and the end of this web knew what the money was for. At the beginning were Representative George Mahon of Texas, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee and its Defense Subcommittee, and Representative Robert Sykes of Florida, chairman of the House Appropriations Military Construction Subcommittee. Today it is rumored that the House Speaker Jim Wright controls the money in Congress and that a power struggle is underway to remove him. Well, we all know he's, uh, he was removed. 
At the end of the line were the President MJ-12, the Director of the Military Office, and the Commander at the Washington Navy Yard. The money was authorized by the Appropriations Committee who allotted it to the Department of Defense as a top secret item in the Army construction program. The Army, however, could not spend it in the fact, in fact, did not even know what it was for. Authorization to spend the money was in reality given to the Navy. The money was channeled to the Chesapeake Division of the Navy engineers who did not know what it was for either. Not even the commanding officer who was, who was an admiral knew what the fund was to be used for. Only one man, a can, Navy commander who was assigned to the Chesapeake Division, but in reality was responsible only to the military office of the White House, knew of the actual purpose, amount, and the ultimate destination of the top secret fund. The total secrecy surrounding the fund meant that at least every trace of, of it would be made to disappear by the, by the very few people who controlled it. There was never been, most likely, never will be an audit of the secret money. Large amounts of money were transferred from the top secret fund to a location at Palm Beach, Florida that belongs to the Coast Guard called Peanut Island. The island is adjacent to property which was owned by Joseph Kennedy. Aha. Uh -huh. The money was said to have been used for landscaping and general beautification. Some time ago, a TV news special on the Kennedy assassination told of a Coast Guard officer transferring money in a briefcase to a Kennedy employee across the property line. Could this have been a secret payment to the Kennedy family for the loss of their son John F. Kennedy? The payments continued through the year 1967 and then stopped. The total amount transferred is unknown and the actual use of the money is unknown. Meanwhile, Nelson Rockefeller changed positions again and this time he was to take C.D. Jackson's old position which had been called a Special Assistant for Psychological Strategy. With Nelson's appointment, the name was changed to Special Assistant for Cold War Strategy. This position would evolve over the years into the same position Henry Kissinger was ultimately to hold under President Nixon. Officially, he was to give advice and assistance in the development of, increasing, of increased understanding and cooperation among all peoples. The official description was a smokescreen for, for secretly he was the presidential coordinator for the intelligence community. In his new post, Rockefeller reported directly and only to the president. He attained meetings of the cabinet and council on foreign economic policy and the National Security Council, which was the highest policy-making body in the government. Nelson Rockefeller was also given a second important job as the head of the secret unit, unit called the Planning Coordination Group, which was formed under NSC 5412-1 in March of 1955. The group consisted of different ad hoc members depending on the subject of the agenda. The basic members were Rockefeller, a representative of the Department of Defense and a representative of the Department of State, and the Director of Cent Central Intelligence. It was soon called the 5412 Committee, or the Special Group. This group was established to rule that covert operations were subject to approval by an executive committee, whereas the last three operations were initiated solely on the authority of the director of the Central Intelligence. By secret executive memorandum, so on and so forth, uh, all covert activities concerned with the alien presence. NSC 5412-1 was created to explain the purpose of these meetings when Congress and the press became curious. Majority 12 was made up of Nelson Rockefeller, the Director of Central Intelli Intelligence, Alan Wells Welsh Dulles, and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles. The Secretary of Defense Charles E. Wilson, the Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff Admiral Arthur W. Radford and the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, J. Edgar Hoover, and six men from the Executive Committee of the Council on Foreign Relations, known as the Wise Men. 
These men were all members of a secret society of scholars that called themselves the Jason Society, or the Jason Scholars, who recruited their members from the Skull and Bones and Scroll and Key Societies at Harvard and Yale, which George Bush was uh, uh, belonged to. Uh, the wise men were key members of the Council on Foreign Relations. There were 12 members, including the six from the government positions, plus majority 12. This group was made up, of, made up over the years of top officers and directors of the Council on Foreign Relations and later the Trilateral Commission. Gordon Dean, George Bush, uh, Brezhnev, Brezhnevsky were among them. The most important and influential of the wise men who served on MJ-12 were John McCloy, Robert Lovett, Avril Harriman, Charles Bolin, George Cannon, and Dean Acheson. Their policies were to last well into the decade of the 70s. It is significant that the President Eisenhower, as well as the first six MJ-12 members from the government, were also members of the Council of Foreign Relations. Through researchers, it was soon discovered that not all the wise men attended Harvard or Yale, and not all of them were chosen for Skull and Bones or Skull and Key membership during those college years. He will be able to quickly clear up this mystery by obtaining the book The Wise Men by Walter Isaacson and Even Thomas, published by Simon & Schuster, New York. Under illustration number nine in the center of the book, you will find the caption, Love It, with the Yale unit, above from far right and on the beach. His intuition into skull and bones came at an air base near Dunkirk. I have found that members were chosen on an ongoing basis by invitation based, merit, based upon merit college posts and was not confined only to Harvard or Yale attendees. A chosen few later initiated into the Jason Society, which were all members of the Council on Foreign Relations and at the time were known as the Eastern Establishment. This should give you a clue as the far-reaching and serious nature of the most secret college societies. The Jason Society is alive and well today, but now includes members of the Trilateral Commission as well. The Trilaterals ex exist secretly several years before 1973. The name of the Trilateral Commission was taken from the alien flag known as the Trilateral Insignia. Majority 12 was to survive right up to the present day. Under Eisenhower and Kennedy, it was erroneously called the 5412 Committee, or more secretly, the Special Group. In the Johnson administration, it had become the 303 Committee because the name 5412 had been compromised in the book, The Secret Government. Actually, NSC 5412-1 was leaked to the author to hide the existence of NSC 54410. Under Nixon, Ford, and Carter, it was called the 40 Committee, and under Reagan, it became the PI 40 Committee. Over all those years, only the name changed. By 1955, it, be, it was obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. Mutilated humans were being found along with mutilated animals all across the United States. And uh, some, a lot of the cover-ups uh, uh, are done by saying, well, it's Satanist cults and so on and so forth. And uh, people who, individual detectives who have looked into the strange uh, circumstances of human mutilations uh, try to gain more information through the FBI and, and uh, were told to back off. Uh, <clears throat> it was suspected that the aliens were not submitted, not submitting a complete list of human contacts and abductees to the MJ-12, and it was suspected that not all abductees had been returned. The Soviet Union was suspected of interacting with them, and this proved to be true. It was learned that the aliens had been and were then manipulating masses of people through secret societies witchcraft, magic, the occult, and religion. After several Air Force combat air engagements with alien craft, it also became apparent that our weapons were no match against them. In November 1955, NSC 5412-2 was issued and establishing a 
study committee to explore all factors which are involved in the making and implementing of foreign policy in the nuclear age. This was only a blanket of snow that covered the real subject of study, the alien question. By secret executive memorandum, the President Eisenhower had commissioned the study group to examine all the facts, evidence, lies, and deception and discover the truth about the alien question. NSC 5412-2 was only a cover that had become necessary when the press began inquiring as to the purpose of regular meetings of such important men. The first meetings began in 1954 and were called the Quantico meetings because they met at Quantico Marine Base. The study group was made up of 35 members of the Council on Foreign Relations, secret scholars known as the Jason Society, and uh, Dr. Edward Teller was invited to participate. Um, also, uh, Dr. Kess Kissinger was chosen as group study director for the second 18 months beginning in November 1955. Nelson Rockefeller was a frequent visitor during the study. The second phase meeting was also held at the Marine Base at Quantico, Virginia, and the group became known as Quantico II. Nelson Rockefeller built a retreat somewhere in Maryland which could only be reached by air for, for MJ-12 and the study committee. They could meet away from public scrutiny. This meeting place was known to the code name Country Club. Complete living, eating, recreation, library, and meeting facilities existed at the location. The study group was publicly closed in later months of 1956 and Henry Kissinger published what was officially termed the results in 1957 as Nuclear Weapons in Foreign Policy by Henry A. Kissinger, published for Council on Foreign Relations by Harper Brothers, New York. In truth, the manuscript had already been 80% written while Kissinger was at Harvard. The study group continued veiled in secrecy. A clue to the seriousness Kissinger attached to the study can be found in statements by his wife and friends. Many of them stated that Henry would leave home early each morning and return late each night without speaking to anyone or responding to anyone. It seemed as if, as if he were in another world which had no room for anyone else. His statements were very revealing. Revelations of the alien presence and the actions during the study must have been a great shock. Henry Kissinger was definitely out of character during the time surrounding these meetings. He would never again be affected in this manner, no matter the seriousness of any subsequent event. On many occasion, on occasions, he would work very late into the night after having already put in a full day. His, be his behavior eventually led to divorce. A major finding of the alien study was that the public could not be told, as it was believed that this would most certainly lead to economic collapse, collapse of religious structure, and national panic, which could lead into anarchy. Secrecy thus continued. An offshoot of this finding was that if the, pub if the public could not be told then, the Congress could not be told, thus funding for the projects and research would have to be, be coming from outside the government. In the meantime, money was to be obtained from the military budget and from CIA confidential non-appropriated funds. Another major finding was that the aliens were using humans and animals for a source of glandular secretions enzymes, hormonal secretions, blood in a horrific genetic experiments. The aliens explained these actions are necessary to their survival. They stated that their genetic structure had deteriorated and that they were no longer able to reproduce. They stated if they were unable to improve their genetic structure, their race would soon cease to exist. We looked upon their explanations with extreme suspicion. Since our weapons were literally useless against the aliens, MJ-12 decided to continue friendly diplomatic relations with them until such a time as we were able to develop a technology which would, would then enable us to challenge them on a military basis. Overtures would have to be made to the Soviet Union and the other nations to join forces for the survival of humanity. 
Uh, this is the reason why everything got so nice and warm and cozy with the Soviet Union. In the meantime, plans were developed to research and construct two weapon systems using conventional and nuclear technology, which would hopefully bring us to parity. The results of the, search, of the research were projects Joshua and Excalibur. Joshua was a weapon captured from the Germans, which at the time was capable of shattering four-inch thick armor plate at a range of two miles using low-aimed, low-frequency sound waves. And it was believed that this weapon could be effective against the alien craft and beam weapons. Excalibur was a weapon carried by a missile not to exceed three, not to exceed 30,000 feet and not to deviate from the designated target more than 50 meters. And it would penetrate a thousand meters of tough, hard packed soil, which, which that is found in New Mexico. It would carry a one megaton warhead and was intended for use in destroying the aliens in their underground bases. Joshua was developed successfully, but never used to my knowledge. Excalibur was not pushed until recent years, and now there is an unprecedented effort to develop this weapon. This is being developed in Los Angeles, and it's not known exactly where. The events at Fatima in the early part of the century were scrutinized. On suspicion that it was an alien manipulation, as you know, the, there was a group of children that had a religious experience which they felt was, uh, uh, you know, Mother Mary coming down and giving them some kind of spiritual message. Uh, turned out to be something other than that. Um, on suspicion that it was an alien manipulation, an intelligence operation was put into, no into motion to penetrate the secrecy surrounding the event. The United States utilized its Vatican moles, people who, uh, you know, were spying in, in the Vatican, that had been recruited and nurtured during World War II and soon obtained the entire Vatican study, which included the prophecy. This prophecy stated that if man did not turn from evil and place himself at the feet of Christ, the planet would self-destruct and the events described in the book of Revelations would indeed come to pass. Well, many times these aliens will uh, communicate with people depending on what your frame of mind and your religious preferences, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, they don't really quite know other ways of uh, dealing with humanity on a rational basis. Uh, it stated that a child would be born who would unite the world in a plan for world peace and a false religion beginning in 1992. By 1995, the people would discern that he was evil and was indeed the Antichrist. World War III would begin in the Middle East in 1995, an invasion of Israel by United Arab Nation using conventional weapons, which would culminate in a nuclear holocaust in the year 1999. Between 1999 and 2003, most of the life on this planet would suffer horribly and die as a result. The return of Christ would occur in, 19, er, in the year two, 2011. Well, this is all spoofy stuff that the aliens are... are uh, feeding us just for more uh, fun and games and manipulation. When the aliens were confronted with this funding, they, with this finding, they confirmed that it was true. Uh, the aliens explained that they had created us through hybrid, hybridization and had manipulated the human race through religion, Satanism, witchcraft, magic, and the occult. Uh, this is all more disinformation from them. Uh, there's been other species that have been uh, uh, genetically ma manipulating the human species. In fact, the more human representations um, uh, were responsible for the quick event of Cro-Magnon Man occurring. Uh, there's a whole other issue dealing with the history of our genetic makeup. Um, the further, they further explained that we were capable of time travel and the events would indeed come to pass. 
Later exploitation of alien technology by the United States and the Soviet Union utilized time travel confirmed the prophecy. <clears throat> the aliens showed a hologram which they claimed was the actual crucifixion of Christ, which the government filmed. We did not know whether to believe them or not. They were using our genuine religions to manipulate us, or they indeed the source of our religions which they had been ma ma manipulating all along. Or was this the beginning of a scenario of a genuine end of times and the return of Christ which had been predicted in the Bible? No one knew the answer. A symposium was held in 1957 which was attended by some of the great scientific minds then living. They reached the conclusion that by or shortly after the year 2000, the planet would self-destruct due to increased population and man's exploitation of the environment without any help from God or aliens. By secret executive order of, the pres of President Eisenhower, the Jason scholars were ordered to study this scenario and make con recommendations from their findings. The Jason Society confirmed the finding of the scientists and made three recommendations called Alternatives 1, 2, and 3. Alternative 1 was, used, was to use nuclear devices to blast holes in the stratosphere from which heat and pollution would escape into space. Great idea, huh? Change the human cultures from that of exploitation to cultures of environmental protection. Of the three, this was decided to be the least likely to succeed due to the inherent nature of man and the additional damage the nuclear explosions would themselves create. Alternative two was to build a vast network of underground cities and tunnels in which a select representation of all cultures and occupations would survive and carry on the human race. The rest of humanity would be left to fend for themselves on the surface of the planet. Alternative three was to exploit alien and conventional technology in order for a select few to leave the Earth and establish colonies in outer space. I am not able to either confirm or deny the existence of batch consignments of human slaves, which would be used for the manual labor and effort as part of the plan. The code name Adam would be the object of primary interest followed by the planet Mars codenamed Eve. As a delaying action, all three alternatives included birth control, sterilization, and the introduction of deadly microbes to control or slow the growth of Earth's population, which uh, gets into a project that Haig and Kissinger put together called Global 2000, which uh, is a plan to, uh, to lessen the world population by two billion people by the year 2000. More information is will be coming out on that. Um, AIDS is only one result of these plans. There are others. It was decided since the population must be reduced and controlled that it would be in the best interest of the human race to rid ourselves of undesirable elements of our society. The joint U.S. and Soviet leadership dismissed Alternative 1, but ordered work to begin on Alternative 2 and 3 virtually at the same time. In 1959, the RAND Corporation, you'll hear a lot from them occasionally. Uh, a few months ago, they came up uh, with a little story that uh, they'll soon have control of antimatter and uh, be able to develop some kind of type of propulsion systems. We all kind of wonder where that co really comes from. <clears throat> in uh, the symposium report, machines are pictured and described in which, in which they bore a tunnel 45 feet in diameter and at the rate of 5 feet per hour. It also dis displays pictures of huge tunnels and underground vaults containing what appear to be complex facilities and possibly even cities. It appears that the previous five years of all-out underground construction had been significantly had made significant progress by that time. The ruling powers decided that one means of funding the alien connection and other black projects was to corner the illegal drug market. A young ambitious member on the Council on Foreign Relations was approached. His name was George Bush, who at the time was the president and CEO of Zapata Oil based in Texas. 
Zapata Oil was experimenting with the new technology of offshore drilling. It was correctly thought that the drugs could be shipped from South America to the offshore platforms by fishing boat, where it could then be taken to shore by normal transportation used for supplies and personnel. By this method, no customs or law enforcement agency could subject the cargo to search. George Bush agreed to help in the organization and to organize the operation in conjunction with the CIA. The plan worked better than anyone had thought and was since expanded worldwide. And there are now many other methods of bringing the illegal drugs into the country. It must always be remembered, though, that George Bush began sale of drugs to our children. The CIA now controls all the world's illegal drug markets. The official space program was boosted by President Kennedy in his inaugural address when he mandated that the United States put a man on the moon before the end of the decade. Although innocent in its conception, this mandate enabled those in charge to funnel vast amounts of money into the black projects and conceal the real space program from the American people. A similar program in the Soviet Union served the same purpose. In fact, a joint alien United States and Soviet Union base already existed on the moon at the very moment Kennedy spoke those words. On May 22, 1962, a space probe landed on Mars and confirmed the existence of an environment which could support life. Not long afterward, the construction of a colony on the planet Mars began in earnest. Today, cities exist on Mars populated by specially select people from different cultures and occupations, taken from all over the Earth. A public charade of antagonism between the Soviet Union and the United States has been maintained over all these years in order to fund projects in the name of national defense, when in the fact we are the closest allies. At some point, President Kennedy discovered portions of the truth concerning the drugs and the aliens. He issued an ultimatum in 1963 to MJ-12. President Kennedy assured them that if he did not clean up the, the drug problem, he would. He informed drug, um, MJ-12 that he intended to reveal the, president's, the presence of aliens to the American people within the following year and ordered a plan developed to implement his decision. President Kennedy was not a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and knew nothing of Alternative 2 or 3. Internationally, the operations were supervised by an executive committee known as the Policy Committee. In the United States, they were supervised by MJ-12 and, and the Soviet Union by its sister organization. President Kennedy's decision struck fear into the hearts of those in charge. His assassination was ordered by the Policy Committee and order was carried out by the agents of MJ-12 in Dallas. President Kennedy was murdered by a Secret Service agent who drove his car in the motorcade in act and the act is plainly visible in the film. Watch the driver and not Kennedy when you, build, when you view the film. All of the witnesses who were close enough to the car to see William Greer shoot Kennedy, and uh, there was also a specific type of high-powered rifle uh, and a special type of projectile in it that uh, also came from the knoll or the hill. Um, back again. All the witnesses who were close enough to the car to see William Greer shoot Kennedy were themselves all murdered within two years of, of the event. The Warren Commission was a farce and the Council and the Foreign Relations members made up the majority of its panel. They succeeded in snowing the American people and many other patriots who attempted to reveal the alien secret may also have been murdered throughout the intervening years. During the era of the United States, during a during the era of the United States, initial space exploration and moon landings was accom accompanied by alien craft. The moon base dubbed Luna was sighted and filmed by the Apollo astronauts. Domes, spires, tall round structures which looked like silos, huge T-shaped mining vehicles which left stitch marks like tracks in uh, on the lunar surface, an extremely large as well as small alien craft appeared in the photographs. It is a joint United States, Russian, and alien bases. They were ordered 
to remain silent or to suffer extreme penalty of death in the term of expediency. When astronaut actually did talk to the British producers and the TV program exposed alternative three. Well, here we are uh, in a whole particular problem. There's certainly uh, more information to get into, but I'm getting a high sign to, or a high sign to call time. Uh, this is a report that was uh, put together by William Cooper, who is an ex-naval intelligence person. Uh, he still receives documents from people that are involved in many of the intelligence networks that feel the same way as he do, does, that uh, they're sworn and uphold the Constitution of the United States and so on and so forth. And they find what's going on is uh, very dastardly and uh, uh, they're trying to get information out of, about all this. Now this is happening with one particular group of uh, extraterrestrials and certainly there are others that are interacting. Uh, again, I said uh, they're very much in human form because we are kind of related and they are interested in uh, the outcome of uh, what's going on here on this planet. Uh, they come from the Pleiades. There's two different groups so far that's been determined. Um, there's also a group that comes from the star system Procyon. Uh, the history goes back far into uh, another star system, but that's another time and place to discuss. So keep your eyes and ears open, and I uh, hope you enjoyed all this information. Any questions? Why did Jack Young get married? Well, that would have caused the problem. Uh, it would have been exposed a little bit more. She saw what was happening, that's why she started to go off the back of the car. She thought she was going to be next. Uh -huh. Why'd she keep her mouth shut? Uh, she would have been terminated if she would have said something. She's, she's pretty well aware of the. Thank you.